So, hello everyone, and welcome to Running Kafka in Kubernetes, a practical guide. Thank you so much for coming to my talk today. Um, I know there's so many good talks happening in every session, so I'm very honoured that you've chosen to come hear what I have to say. So, my name is Kate Stanley. I'm a developer at IBM. I actually work on this product called Event Streams, um, and basically, it's a fully supported Kafka offering, but the key thing is it's deployed on top of Kubernetes. So both myself and my team have had a lot of time and experience of running Kafka on Kubernetes. And so the idea of this talk is to, to show you or talk through some of the aspects of Kubernetes that you should be aware of if you're going to start trying to run Kafka on top of it. And then what aspects of Kafka you need to be aware of to make sure that these two technologies work really well together. So before I get started, I just want to do a little poll so I can kind of see the level of the room. So who here is fairly comfortable with how Kubernetes works? Yeah, most people. Cool. And what about Kafka? Not so many people. Okay, cool. So I feel like we're going on a journey of our kind of infrastructure and where things are going. We've started off with monolithic applications that had one big data store, then continuing to break these down into microservices. And initially, these microservices would have had APIs and have REST requests uh, between them. And that's where quite a lot of people are at at the moment. But more and more, I'm seeing people moving to actually having an event backbone as part of their applications and having more publish subscribe type requests going around their system. So I do quite a lot of different talks about how, why you should move to having an event backbone and that kind of thing. But it is something that is gaining popularity. And people are realizing that actually you can get a lot of um, extra value from flowing events and being event-based instead of always being data-driven. So we've got this system. We've also potentially got some databases that are sitting alongside, and this is kind of the point that we're getting to. And of course, when everyone started moving to microservices, um, we all thought this is great. We're solving all of these problems around having these massive applications that we can't update. We're now able to iterate really quickly, write new applications and put them up. But of course, the big thing that hits you in the face straight away is I've now gone from one box to multiple different boxes. And so then that has brought about the rise of containers, giving you encapsulation of your dependencies, isolation, and dev prod parity. So containers, great. They solve some of these problems that have been brought in by splitting down into these smaller pieces. But of course, moving to containers also brings in other considerations. So how am I going to do routing? And how am I going to be handling failure? And tools like Kubernetes step in to try and solve some of these problems. And we'll see that particularly routing and handling failure are two of the main things that you have to really think about when you want to start running Kafka on top of Kubernetes. So for those of you who don't know, Kubernetes is helmsman in ancient Greek. Uh, it's declarative. So the key thing is you describe a desired state and Kubernetes makes it happen. Now, um, as is seen by the show of hands, most people here are pretty comfortable with Kubernetes. Um, but I'm going to introduce one particular thing to focus on because that will be relevant later when we look at Kafka. So when we're running on Kubernetes, we have this idea of a pod, which might have one or more container inside of it. And if we want to scale out, we run multiple different containers. Uh, pods, sorry. So this makes sense. We have multiple different versions of the same application running, and we need some way to manage these to decide how many there should be. And the key thing with Kubernetes, because it's declarative, we want to be able to tell Kubernetes, I want three or I want five, and it should just make it happen. And normally, when you first get started with Kubernetes, you'll be introduced to a deployment. So you define a deployment, and that will manage to make sure that you have the right number of pods running. And then you need some way to do routing. So Kubernetes comes in very handy with routing. It provides a mechanism called a service. And the service is providing a DNS route for you to then route all these different pods. 
and they're of course described by YAML files. So we have our deployments for managing the pods and making sure that we have the right number, and then we have these kinds of service to do all the routing. So we've had this rise of microservices, which has then led to the questions around how do we solve routing and how do we solve failure. And we've then brought along Kubernetes, which is starting to solve some of these problems. But at the same time, there has been this shift to being more data-centric over event-centric. So one of the examples I like to use here is if you think about when you're traveling from one place to another, if I looked at my journey coming from home to this conference here, if you were looking at a data-centric approach, you would just look up in the database what is the current state of Kate as she's traveling. So right now, obviously, I am stood here. So I'm at the conference. If you had looked a couple of days ago, maybe I would have been on a train. Maybe I would have been on a tram. But you get that one data point. If you move to being event-centric and looking at events, you're looking at the data in a different way. So you're getting a, rather than a Kate is here, it's Kate switched from being on a train to on a tram. So you actually end up with the same inferred outcome that I'm now stood here, but you get to see that change of events and you can gain value from that. So this is leading to the rise of having event streaming applications with an event backbone, and the very simplest case is having microservices that use this event backbone to communicate. And we have these event sources. So this could be from clicks on a website, it could be from a database, it could be from uh, sensors. We can do some stream processing. We might want to store these events going forward. So it's worth noting that Kafka is not designed to store events forever, it, but it does provide persistence. But if you want to store these events forever, you'll probably need an event archive. And then it allows you to build in things like notifications. And here you'll notice I haven't specifically said Kafka in the middle. This is a pattern that many people are moving towards and having an event backbone basically at the center of everything that they do. And that allows you to have better insight into what's going on and also allows you to have more asynchronous communication. So that's where Kafka comes in. So Kafka is an open source distributed streaming platform and it offers publish and subscribe to streams of events. It allows you to store events in a durable way and to process streams of events as they occur. It's a really growing ecosystem. It's becoming sort of the de facto event streaming platform. And I go along and talk at lots of the Kafka um, conference events. And every time I go, there's just more and more people there. So it's definitely gaining um, sort of community push. So for Kafka, I think the best and most challenging thing about it is it's really, really configurable. So you can set up Kafka to do kind of whatever you want, whatever suits your use case around event streaming. But because of this, there can be a bit of a learning curve when you get started. So I did a deep dive yesterday to try and cover as much as possible around Kafka. I'm going to be doing a 15 minute quickie later. Um, but for this talk, what I'll do is just pull out the key things that you need to know before you start running it on top of Kubernetes. So the basic building block we start with with Kafka is we have our topics. So a topic is a way to store a set of events. We call these events in Kafka records. And the key thing is they are ordered records. They are immutable. Once they end up in the topic, they stay there. And we refer to them as an offset. But the key thing is you're always appending to the end. These topics um, and all of these events get stored in brokers. So in Kafka, we have a cluster. It's a distributed system. So you would run one or more brokers. Normally, people start with three. And this is where all of the traffic is going to be going and where all of your events will be stored. So this is your event backbone. Now, one of the key things that uh, Kafka provides is it has built-in scalability. So we have partitions here. So a topic is separated into one or more partitions. 
you get to choose how many partitions that you want. And basically what will happen is these partitions will be spread out across the different brokers. And for this reason, then you can have scalability because it means you're not having everyone who wants to produce and consume to one topic always talking to the same broker. So it gets spread out. So that's great. Um, but it also provides built-in replication as part of Kafka as well. So for a particular topic and a particular partition within that topic, you have a broker that is nominated as the leader for that topic. And any applications that want to produce and consume, they have to come back and talk to this leader. Under the covers, what's actually happening is all of the events on this topic and this partition are being replicated to the other brokers. Now, you get to choose how much they get replicated, and we'll see that there has some follow-on effects later. Um, but in this case, the assumption is that I've chosen a replication factor of three, so I've got one leader and then two followers. And this provides fault tolerance within Kafka, because if the leader goes down, I haven't lost any data because all of my, assuming I've set the replication factor in a good way, all of my data is being already been copied over. I haven't lost any data. And what Kafka will do is it will trigger a leader election and we just get a new leader for our topic and our petition. And what Kafka will do is we'll just tell all of our clients that were connected, that we're trying to produce and consume to topic A, partition one, that actually the leader lives over here now and they will just reroute themselves. So we're all good. So this is how Kafka provides both scalability and fault tolerance. And we'll see specifically this leader election um, and how that works is very important for running on top of Kubernetes. In Kafka itself, we also have producers. So um, I just want to add this terminology so that if I say it's not confusing. Producers is the name we give to applications that are producing to Kafka, so sending events into Kafka. And then we have consumers. So a consumer is an application that's pulling events from Kafka. And the consumers can work as part of a consumer group. And that basically means that they work together to pull from a particular topic. OK, so that's kind of an overview of some of the things that we need to start thinking about with Kafka when, and how we've got to this point. And now that more and more people are running all of their applications on Kubernetes, it makes complete sense to run Kafka on Kubernetes as well. And then you're all running on the same infrastructure. In the past, people have said, well, would you really want to run Kafka on Kubernetes? Is there um, any downsides and actually there is added complexity but there's no reason why you shouldn't happily run Kafka on Kubernetes. The caveat is that you need to make sure you understand what Kubernetes is doing and what Kafka is doing and make sure they work well together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start sort of as though you were going to start moving your Kafka onto Kubernetes and what were the things you're going to have to think about and in which order. So the first thing we're going to talk about is Kafka pods. So I said earlier, when you start running on Kubernetes, the first thing you do is stand up a pod. And I don't know about you, the first thing I do when I stand up a pod is I do QCTL, get pods, and then wait. And what I'm actually waiting for is everything to become ready and running. So the first thing we need to work out is for Kafka, how do we make this happen so that um, Kubernetes is happy? So Kubernetes has different health checks. And these health checks are in a liveness probe and a readiness probe. So the liveness probe is a check to say, is the container running? And the key thing here is, if there is a failure, Kubernetes will restart your container. So if you get this wrong, you will end up with a Kafka broker that just continually restarts. So we definitely don't want that. But there's also a readiness probe. And a lot of people will just set, when they're particularly getting started with Kubernetes, will just set the liveness probe and the readiness probe to be the same thing. And for a lot of applications, maybe it's doing something simple, that might be enough. But there is a subtle difference of what Kubernetes is going to do under the covers. So for a readiness probe, what it's actually saying is, is this container ready to receive requests? 
And if there's a failure, it can remove it from the service list. So that service that we're using to route to all of your pods, you can decide whether it responds to this readiness probe, whether it looks at the um, readiness list. But if it does, and your pod isn't ready, then your service won't be able to route to it. So you have to make sure you've got these set up correctly. So what should we do for Kafka? Well, Kafka um, for liveness, you can do quite a basic check, really. Checking that the ports are open, checking that it responds to the basic Kafka protocol, that's probably enough to say, OK, my Kafka is alive. I don't want you to restart it. For me, the more interesting one comes around readiness. And this is where we see different people in the industry doing different things. So in some ways, it's up to you to decide what ready means for you and your Kafka cluster. So you could look at a few different things. You could look at, can Kafka talk to Zookeeper? I haven't mentioned Zookeeper so far. So uh, for those of you who have had a go at running Kafka, you'll know that you also have to have Zookeeper running at the same time. And actually, if you run everything locally, you have to start Zookeeper first, otherwise Kafka is really not happy. So Zookeeper is being used by Kafka to store metadata um, and some other information. It's not really important necessarily for this talk, what's being stored in Zookeeper, but the point is Kafka has to be able to talk to Zookeeper in order for it to function properly. There's some work in the community to actually remove that dependency on Zookeeper, but as of right now, and probably at least for the next six months, if not more, you do need Zookeeper if you want to run Kafka. So a reasonable check of whether Kafka is ready to receive traffic would be can it talk to Zookeeper. Some other um, things I've pe seen people doing is checking the broker state YAMA metric, and we'll see what that is in a minute, or checking for in-sync replicas. So let's have a look at this YAMA metric. So this is actually from a project called Strimzy. So Strimzy is a Kubernetes-based Kafka open source project. I'll go into a little bit more what it is right at the end. But they're using this Kafka agent in order to verify if Kafka is ready. So what they're actually doing, if I go across, hang on, here we go. So what they're actually doing is this is a J console. So Kafka gives out JMX metrics. In order to start Kafka with the JMX metrics, I just had to set this JMX port. And then I can just run J console. And this is all the JMX metrics that I get. And if you go down to Kafka server and then broker state, and we look at the value here, so I do have Kafka running. There we go. You can see it's got a value of three. It's not very informative, but if you go read the docs, you will see that that means that the Kafka broker has declared itself as ready. So the interesting thing that uh, is actually happening in Strimzy is they've got this app that's running alongside Kafka, and what they're actually doing is checking this metric. And when the metric goes to ready, they're writing a file somewhere on the local pod, and then they're using that to check readiness. So that's something you could look into. It's quite an uh, interesting way to approach it. I also talked about thinking about in-sync replicas. So this is another thing to have a think about when you're starting to look at Kafka. So there is a setting in Kafka called the min in-sync replicas. So when I create my topic, I decide how many replicas that I want. In this case, I have chosen three. And if the other brokers aren't keeping up with replication, then they get marked as in sync or out of sync. So if, if they can't keep up, they're out of sync. So in this scenario, I've got min in sync replica set to two. The replicas for my topic is three, which is why we've got stuff in every one of them. And my producers and consumers are quite happily producing and consuming. But if one of my other brokers now goes to out of sync, we've suddenly got a problem. And the problem we have is the whole idea around Kafka is we have this replication so that we don't end up losing data. So it wouldn't make sense to allow the producer to continue producing to 
the topic because if the leader suddenly fails, nobody's replicating and you're going to lose data. And because we've told Kafka we want a min in sync replicas of two, we've said that we care about this. So what Kafka will do is it will tell the producers that they can't produce anymore. And actually the producers will get an error message that says the min in sync replicas hasn't been met. Now it might be that actually min in sync replicas, maybe we don't mind if these producers get these error messages, maybe they can just handle that quite happily. But it might be worth considering if, your cons if you know that all of your producers are going to be getting min in sync replica errors, maybe you should make your brokers go unready so that the producers aren't actually having to put load through your brokers and you can go and work out what's happened. But this whole min in sync replicas thing is also interesting for another reason. And that's because of rolling updates. So when I have a set of pods that are running the same thing, so in this case they're all running Kafka, I've got three of them, you can tell Kubernetes what update strategy you want to use. So when you want to make a change, you can tell it not to just kill everything and start everything back up again, but instead do this in a sort of more choreographed manner. So the way you do that is by setting this property, spec.updateStrategy, to be rolling update. That means if I say I'm going to update container B to now be container C, I tell the deployment, OK, this is what I want. And what Kubernetes will do is it will make it happen. So the strategy is rolling update. It will delete or take down the pod that has the, the um, it will take down one of the pods first. That will then come back. And it will come back sort of starting up. Once it declares itself as running and ready, the next pod goes. Then that one starts to come back up. It's got the new container. Is it running and ready? Yes, OK, the next one can go, etc. But the key thing here is if you don't configure your Kafka readiness probe to wait and say that it's ready once other replicas have caught up, you could get in a scenario where one of the pods goes down, the broker gets killed, it comes back up, maybe your replicas um, are only on two of the brokers, maybe you've only set replication to two. So you've got this new one that's come up and it doesn't know anything. And you've got the next one along that's still got all the data, so you're all good. You haven't lost any data. But if you don't wait until your new broker catches up with everyone else, the, new, the next broker goes down, and suddenly you've lost data. So it's not just important when you first stand up your brokers to make sure you wait until they're ready to start flowing all the traffic, but it's also important for these rolling updates as well. And we can see a little bit more um, how you can understand the state of your cluster. So I've got a Zookeeper already running, and I've got three Kafkas running. Hopefully they're happy. We shall see. I started them a little while ago now. Um, and to start up multiple different Kafkas locally, I had to change a couple of the settings um, just to kind of tweak so they're running on different ports and that kind of thing. I already created a topic, um, and I called it test. And you can see there that it's got a replication factor of three. So I've got three Kafka brokers running, and I've got a replication factor of three. And this topic's sh like shell script here, this is actually provided as part of Kafka. You can make the use of this the minute you download Kafka. I can use it to list the topics. I should only have two. One of them is my internal topic that's being used to uh, do state. That's the consumer offsets. And one of them is my new test topic that I created. And as you can see from the command above, a describe will give me some more information. And key, the key thing is here you can see the replicas. So it's been replicated on some different brokers. So my brokers have different IDs. I've got two, one, and zero. And it's telling me which ones are in sync as well. So I'm all good. Everything's running. If I uh, run a producer, which is this command, against test. So the reason that it already thinks they're in sync is I already sent some messages in before. But if I send some more, 
and then we go describe our topic again, we should be all good. It should replicate fairly quickly, I would hope. And they'll all be in sync. There we go. Cool. But if I now go and kill off some of these uh, Kafkas, so I'm going to kill this one. And they're all going to be very unhappy with me. And then I send some more uh, data. Uh, I can now run this again. And you'll notice there's a, probably been a slight tweak here. So the leader here, there you go, the leader here was listed as two. Because I killed one of the brokers, it's had a leader election. So there's a new leader, leader one. Um, the replicas, it's all still replicating, or it thinks it's going to replicate across all of them, but the in-sync replicas here has changed. So you can see now I've only got replicas on one or zero. And then again, if I were to delete the next one, you can see that it would go down again. So if I do that, make sure I kill the right one. We're going to have another leader election. I can send some more data. I describe my topic again. You should see the leader will change now to zero, and I will only have one in sync replica. And if we go back and look over here, you'll see that there is actually some other data that I can get hold of. What's it done? So in my uh, Kafka cluster, I can have a look at partitions, and I can view the in sync replicas count. So you can see here, I can actually use the command line, but I can also use these YAMA metrics, these JMX metrics, in order to actually see what's going on. So if I go into attributes value and refresh that, it should tell me that I only have one. So I only have one in sync replica. And you can see in here, that I can also see um, how many are under my min in sync replicas. So if you want to do some checks to say, have I got the right number of in sync and all of that kind of thing, what you can do is you can make use of these metrics here. So hooking up to the JMX metrics for Kafka is a really good idea. But if you want to do a quick cursory check, just doing a describe of the topic is good enough to kind of give you that information. And you're getting quite a lot of information out of here. So you're not only getting the replication factor, but also the leader, what replicas it thinks it should be doing so that sort of should match up to the replication factor. If I had four brokers, one of these wouldn't be on this list. But it also tells you your in-sync replicas as well. OK. So we've done a demo. So what about Zookeeper? Uh, so Zookeeper. Um, you do need to have health checks on that as well. It's something you have to stand up straight away as soon as you stand up Kafka. And for the liveness probe, there's a really nice four letter word you can use, which is, are you okay? Um, so the default port for Zookeeper when you run locally is 2181. So I can do echo, are you okay? Um, to localhost 2181. And it should come back if it's running successfully with, I am okay. So we're all good there. What about readiness? So for those of you who aren't aware, Zookeeper runs as a quorum. So you would normally have at least three Zookeeper and three Kafka brokers as part of your setup of Kafka. Generally, we find that three is enough. Even if you're scaling out to quite a lot of brokers, three Zookeepers is probably fine. But it's important to know whether they're working together in a quorum. And you can find that out, again, using one of these four-letter words doing echo SRVR, and it will print out this information here. And the thing you're looking for is that mode. So if you can check each of your zookeepers and they say either they're a leader or not, then you're all good. And actually, if I were to run this command here uh, against my zookeeper, so I'm actually not uh, running more than one zookeeper. So if I echo SRVR to local host 2181. Oh, or not. I don't need the colon. There we go. Uh, you can see the mode is different. So this one says it's in standalone mode. Generally, you wouldn't want that because if Zookeeper goes down, then um, 
you've kind of lost data and things unless you've got persistence turned on. But generally, you want more than one zookeeper. So you probably don't want it to tell you you're in standalone mode, but that's something to look out for. If your zookeepers haven't started correctly, they might tell you they're in standalone. OK, so there's quite a few things to think about when you're getting started. And now that we have our pods up and running, they say that they're ready. We think if they get restarted, the other ones aren't going to be restarted in a weird order. We need to think about actually managing them going forwards. So we have this Kafka cluster. And I said that Kafka um, does all of its sort of availability and uh, fault tolerance by copying the data across. But it might be that you want to have logs or things like that stored, or even the events stored more persistently. So you could store that in the Kafka brokers. That's fine. But if something were to happen and all your brokers die at once, then you're in trouble. So it's a good idea, just in case, to also have um, more external persistence turned on for your different brokers. And if you're doing this with a deployment, you can use a persistent volume and a persistent volume claim. So we write a persistent volume. This is a Kubernetes base concept. It's not specific to Kafka. And it basically says, I've got some storage, and this is where it lives, and describes it in some way. And then you also write a persistent volume claim. So that's sort of owned by the deployment, or the pod even. And that's basically saying, this is the kind of storage that I'm looking for, and Kubernetes will match them up. If you go ahead and do this with Kafka, and quite happily just um, start running things, if you, um, what you might find quite quickly is you run into errors that look like this. Inconsistent broker ID exception. Configured broker ID 1 doesn't match stored broker 0 in meta.properties. Now, the reason for this is in Kafka, we have this whole idea of a leader, right? So we need to know which broker is which. It isn't enough for them all to be identical. So they all have to have a unique ID. So earlier when I said that I started three Kafka brokers, one of the things I had to do was change that broker.id. So I had 0, 1, and 2. And those matched up to those in-sync replicas we were looking at. And you can see when Kafka itself starts, it prints out quite happily, saying, this is my ID. If you see this error message, though, what's actually happened is Kafka will, when it starts up, it will also write out a meta.properties file. And the meta.properties file also has a broker ID in it. And it will write out whatever one it started with. So if I've got my meta.properties file in my storage, under my persistent volume where I've put it, my broker goes down, a different broker comes back up that has a different ID and picks up that storage, that's when you get this error message, because there's an inconsistent state. So unlike a lot of other applications, potentially, where if they start up from scratch, like it would be annoying if they didn't pick up the same storage, but it wouldn't be the end of the world. For Kafka, you can't run Kafka if it picks up the wrong storage again. So we can solve this using stateful sets. So rather than managing our Kafka pods using deployments, we should be using stateful sets instead. And that's because they maintain a sticky identity for each pod. So it matches up quite well to this idea of broker IDs in Kafka. Again, you can have persistence via a persistent volume and a persistent volume claim. And this gives you this nice flow. So we have our data wherever our storage is. We have our persistent volume that points to it. Then when pod comes up, so say this is broker zero, it has a persistent volume claim. And it binds to the persistent volume. And we might have another one, so say we've got broker one as well, that has its own persistent volume claim. They might be using the same underlying place to store. That part's not really important. The important thing is they've done all of this binding. What Kubernetes will do, because you're running a stateful set, when the pods go down, the persistent volume claim will stay there. That's important to note anyway, because if you go deleting your Kafka because you want it to, you will have to clear up your persistent volume claims as well. But the persistent volume claims stay there, which means the data stays there. As soon as the persistent volume claim is gone, the data's gone. But when they come back, they will actually pick up the same persistent volume claim back again. And then you won't have your problem with these IDs. 
So it's important that you're using stateful sets, but also it's important to understand why, and this is the reason. And so it means that if you're looking at different storage solutions, you need to keep in mind that your pods can't just randomly swap data um, that they're storing under the covers. They need to have that matching ID. OK, so we know how to stand it up and get everything running. We are managing things correctly so that we're not running into issues with storage. So let's talk about deploying Kafka pods. So I talked about replication and the fact that we have this leader. You'll see this is very important for when you're running on Kubernetes because I keep coming back to it. If the leader goes down, then we're all fine. We don't lose any data. When we're running on top of Kubernetes, the important thing to note here is the most likely thing to fail in your Kubernetes is not the whole thing. The most likely is one particular node. So it makes sense to make use of the Kubernetes anti-affinity rules. So this is a pod anti-affinity. It's preferred during scheduling and ignored during execution. So as much as possible, it will keep the Kafkas separate to each other. And that will mean they're spread out nicely across the different nodes. We can also do a similar thing with Zookeeper if we want to. This one's not quite so important. Uh, the important one is the Kafka. But if you put your Zookeepers next to your Kafkas, then it will spread out your Zookeepers as well. Equally, you could just stick with having your Zookeepers being separate from each other. It's up to you. But the key thing is you need to make sure that you don't end up with all of your brokers on one node. So this is just a quick example. If you were to run my product event streams and then do kubectl get nodes, this is an example where I was running with three workers. And then I had one node for etcd management master and proxy. And then if you describe one of those particular nodes, you will see that it has correctly spread out the Kafkas and the Zookeepers. So for running things in the right places on Kubernetes, it's fairly straightforward. You can make use of this. Um, you can also look into availability zones. But again, it's very similar to what you would do in a normal Kubernetes app. And Kafka will support you telling it about availability zones. Accessing Kafka. So this is one of the ones that gets a little bit more interesting. And there's quite a big leap between running it locally on my machine and everything's just local host to actually running in containers, but then in Kubernetes as well. So again, it comes back to this replication. And the key thing here is all of my clients have to talk to the leader. So the way this works in Kafka is when a client tries to connect, you give it a bootstrap server. Run it. When I was running my producer earlier, I just picked localhost uh, 9092. I only had one broker running there. My other two were on 9093 and 9094. And we saw that the leader was actually broker two to begin with. But although I told my app about just about the first broker, broker zero, it was still managing to send all of that data. And the reason it does that is because when you get a request into Kafka, what Kafka will do is say, this is the leader for that partition and topic you're trying to write to. Go talk to them. So that means that you need a mechanism to be able to targetively route to the different brokers, which is slightly different to the default approach when you're running things in Kubernetes and you tend to do sort of round robins. Luckily, stateful sets give you a nice solution here. So you use something called a headless service. And you define this by setting the cluster IP to none. And you can see here I've put a selector. My selector is app Kafka. So that means I basically want this headless service to route to anything that is Kafka related. So there's my service there. But the key thing is it means I can actually address a pod directly. So normally, with Kubernetes, if you're running in a deployment, you would never directly call to a specific pod. You would go to a deployment, uh, not deployment, you would go to a service, because that's what it's there for. But in this case, because those brokers do have those unique IDs and they're important for leadership, you have to be able to route directly to them. So that's what this headless service gives you. You can talk to it using pod name and then um, the name of your headless service, so I've called it my release Kafka headless, namespace service, and then whatever port you're actually going to be on. So you've now got a mechanism that you can route it, but you now have to tell Kafka about that mechanism. 
And the reason for that is the configuration options in Kafka for listeners and advertised listeners. So in Kafka, this is in Kubernetes, this is kind of what we've got. We've got our Kafka server running inside a container, so that's the white box, running inside a pod, which is um, we've called broker zero, broker one, broker two, and then we have a service, which is our headless service, and if we route to that specific DNS name, the headless service knows to route us to the right pod. So you have two different settings that you can tell Kafka about. The first one is listeners, the second one is advertised listeners. If you run everything locally, you don't have to care because the listeners um, and advertised listeners just get set to localhost 9092 and you do nothing else. It's all fine. But in this scenario, we have the listeners at that level. So a listener is what the Kafka server itself is going to listen on. So it might still be localhost 9092. If you haven't changed the port, it probably is. You've then got um, an endpoint that you've exposed in your container. So that might be the same port that you're exposing, or you might have mapped it to something different. And you've then got the ones from your pods, but it's the ones from your service that are the advertised listeners. So the way this basically works is you need a mechanism to tell people that aren't the actual broker itself how to route to it. So every single broker will get an advertised listener, and that needs to be the address for everybody else to call so that they can get routed to the right place. So I'm going to show an example just because I think that helps to solidify it a bit more. So here we have, um, I'm running a command. This is actually a, just a CLI that we have as part of event streams, but it's a quick way for me to list everything. So I've listed out everything for broker zero, and I've grepped for the word listeners. So my listeners for all of my Kafkas are set to 9092. So that's fairly standard. But for my advertised listeners, I have told it that specific pod so that we can route to the right places. Now, this all works fine if I'm running all of my applications actually inside Kubernetes as well. I route to the advertised listener, all of the other brokers route to the advertised listener, they get routed through because of the magic of the headless service, and we're all good. But you'll notice that it says internal at the beginning of these. So um, in Kafka, they introduced this idea of having different types of advertised listener. And it works really well for Kubernetes, because if you have applications outside of Kubernetes that want to talk in, you can basically provide different kinds of advertised listeners. So you could provide internal and external, for example. And then you would have, if all of your apps are outside, you have the brokers communicating between each other using the internal one, and then anyone coming in who's a client would use the external one. You get to decide what those words are, we've picked internal in this example, but it's up to you to name them, but it's a really nice feature to help you have all of this different routing in different places. So I've talked about how to get running, the fact that you do have to think quite carefully about what your readiness probe is going to be, and it depends on um, what's very important for you and how you're running your Kafka. You should definitely make use of the metrics, and you should think about um, looking at these min and sync replicas. Using stateful sets gets you all sorts of advantages around persisting data and then obviously being able to root later and thinking about your nodes. So to finish off, I'm going to talk very briefly about automation. So running things in Kubernetes um, is great, but what you often find is if you're going to start up Kafka and Zookeeper for the first time, You've got quite a lot of different things. You'll have to stand up roles, role binding, service accounts, the services, the, the stateful sets, all of that stuff. And actually having things that are going to automate this and particularly doing automate, um, automating the actual update process makes complete sense. Uh, there are two options that I'm going to talk about that is just worth exploring. One of them is Helm charts. So that's what we're currently using in my product. And because we have a community edition, we actually have our Helm charts just um, on GitHub. So feel free to have a look. Um, but the nice thing here with Helm is you can do things like Helm install, Helm upgrade. You can provide pre-install and upgrade hooks. Um, and it provides a kind of abstraction over Kubernetes. So whoever's doing the installing and upgrading sort of doesn't have to worry too much about what's under the covers. So it's a little bit nicer 
um, for people who aren't wanting to get down and like really involved in Kubernetes. Um, and you don't have to write anything in order to, to have this happen. You basically write templates that say, this is what things I want you to create and Helm will then do it. Another option that's becoming more and more popular in the Kubernetes space for management is Kubernetes operators. So Strimzy, the project here is a open source Kubernetes operator for Kafka. And the really nice thing about an operator is it allows you to um, manage your Kafka as though it's like a native Kubernetes object. So you have to define a custom resource to de definition and a custom controller. So the custom resource definition allows you to do things like Kubernetes, kubectl, get Kafka, and it will list what Kafkas you have running. But it's up to you to decide what that means and then to write and run a controller that will allow you to do things like create Kafka and it knows what things it has to stand up. It's very Kubernetes native, but you do need to run this separate deployment and that can come with a lot of overhead, but I would highly recommend you have a look at Strimzy as an option there. It's been recently accepted by CNCF, so it's definitely gaining in popularity um, and the team that work on it are all very lovely. So that is everything I had to tell you about running Kafka on Kubernetes. As you can tell, there are quite a few considerations to think about, but if you get each of these right, you should be able to get to a point where you've got Kafka running nicely. And if something goes wrong with your Kubernetes or you need to change things, Kafka's already set up that it, it should all work as expected. If you want to try Kafka for the first time, I've put the quick start link there. That's a great place to get started. And that shows you some of the... Um, topic shell scripts and create starting Zookeeper and Kafka and things. And if you did want to know more about event streams, it's there. And I do have some Strimzy stickers in my bag. So if you want one, then do come to the front later. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you.